Hey, Smart Pack fans. I'm Smart Packer Sarah. She's Dr. Lydia Gray, and we're back with the March 2018 edition of the Ask the Vet video series. Once again, we're here to answer your horse health questions uh, that were asked and voted on by viewers like you and horse owners like you. And we got a lot of excellent questions last time, so please do keep those coming. And there were two in particular. We have the benefit, we get to see all the questions that yes. get submitted. And then we kind of boil those down and make sure we take out things that have been answered before. Right. Check out our YouTube list. We have all the videos broken out in case you haven't seen those. Um, but some of the videos don't quite make it to the top of the voting list. Some of the list. questions, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the questions don't make it. And so we like to call those out when we see particularly special ones. Yeah. I know you had two favorites this time around. The first they were one especially noteworthy. From YouTube. What's the easiest way to clean your tag? Well, doctor, what have would you so say? Have someone else do it. Okay. So that's great advice. Done. And from Instagram, tips for really spicy horses. I don't eat spicy food myself. I hear milk. Ooh. I hear milk cut spice. I've heard Ron Burgundy say milk was a bad idea. So I don't know if that would be helpful for your spicy horse. Yeah. But let's get into the real questions so we can actually start helping you help your horses. Our first question was asked by Lindsay on the blog, which is blog.smartpack.com. And Lindsay is wondering, my horse has very sensitive skin. Like, so sensitive that if I use too much pressure with a curry comb, he looks like he has hives. He never flinches or shows any discomfort. What a sweetheart when being groomed and the bumps don't seem to bother him but they last for 30 to 40 minutes is there anything I can do to help him so unfortunately I think there's more going on here than just a horse with sensitive skin okay I think and this is definitely something she'll want to contact her veterinarian about and I even have a plan for her at the end I think your horse might have something called pressure hives Ooh pressure urticaria is the fancy word if you want to get really fancy you know how Nels likes those fancy words it's to put on the this screen. one I hope fits on the screen it's a really <laughs> long one dermatographism wow the shortened version is dermographism but they both work they just mean that your horse does develop hives I think she's really seeing hives due to pressure you think of hives as sort of an just allergic physical response. pressure just physical pressure okay. yeah um, Hives can actually occur not just from insect bites or something you ate or medications, but pressure, temperature, heat and cold, sunlight, stress. There's all sorts of weird things you wouldn't expect can cause hives. Now, what I think she should do is, she. it sounds like this is very reproducible. So don't touch your horse. Call the vet, schedule a visit have the vet come out and look at the horse like pre-brushing. Normal. Normal, right. And then do what she normally does, brush the horse and let the vet see these hives or wheels appear and let the vet inspect them then. And I think that will bring them to a diagnosis. Now, once you have the diagnosis, then it's time for treatment. I think I used unfortunately already, but I'm gonna use it again. Unfortunately, because this is such an abnormal, uncommon condition, there's not a lot, like, we don't know exactly why horses or people get this too, get it. And so we don't know what to, works to treat it. Antihistamines seem to have some um, positive results in some cases in people. Mm -hmm. So that might be where the vet starts. There's always steroids. Um, but it's not something you usually think of with allergic hives. You can remove the stimulus. Mm -hmm. it's, you can't not brush your horse or not put right. tack on. So. Sure. This is a bit of a, um, this is gonna be a challenge for you guys, but the first step I think is diagnosis and having your vet actually see the same thing that she described. Yeah. Okay, well good luck, Lindsay. Oh, Let boy. us know how it goes. Yeah. Question number two is submitted by Amanda G, also on the blog, and Amanda's wondering, should there be a concern of stripping the natural oils of the fur, or coat, while grooming? I know bathing too often can dry out the coat and skin, but can you over-groom in a way that strips the coat as well? Oh, interesting. So she's thinking about grooming, stripping the coat, mm -hmm. not just bathing. I'm a bit of a religious groomer, and I don't want to be negatively affecting my horse. Well, that's a really good concern. It you is. always want to you think you're doing the right thing make sure it's actually the right yeah, thing because there's so many old wives tales and traditions in horse management that what's interesting is I don't think I've ever been asked no. can I is it possible to groom too much what I've been asked is hey doc 
how much, how little can I groom and still not have horrible problems? Mm -hmm. So I'm used to answering that one. This one, not so much. But it, it's fun because I, I found a bunch of, of my favorite grooming tools. Um, this one I love. This is the Posture Prep mm. uh, Cross Fiber Groomer. Well, I say I love, but I mean, you me too. And then these things are like the best invention since Cody sliced bread. Cody also loves these. These hands-on gloves. I don't mm -hmm. think there's the name. These are fantastic. They get all the little nooks and crannies. Yep. Yeah, that's a very scientific term, anatomical phrasing. And they look intense, but I've never had any sensitivity issues with them. He loves them. Newman does not like the full glove with too much pressure on his face. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's fair. So on his face, I, I go, use I go, it's pretty soft. one of these grooming mitts because the nubbins are really, really small. So that yeah. one's that one's tolerated. So, And then I just want to say that I've never used this on a horse. I use it to clean my brushes. Mm. Shedding like, blade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we like grooming, and she's she's exactly right on because it increases circulation, and that is what releases the oils. It does help with shedding, mm -hmm. you know, grooming. That in the spring you, you groom a lot, more than once a day, even in longer periods each time to help the hairs come out. Uh, I find it's a good good time to bond. Um, I use it to assess the mood for the day, mm -hmm. so I know what kind of ride I'm in for. Um, but from a veterinary standpoint, it's a great time if you groom all over to inspect your horse. Mm -hmm. So if you see a lump or bump or wound or swelling, you can stop grooming and feel it and say, is there heat there? Is there sensitivity? You know, um, so I, I, I can't think of a single con for grooming. I mean, you wouldn't groom over a wound. Right. And you pay special attention to those bony, sensitive areas and sure. use the brush that they yeah. don't give you, you know, nasty faces about. But I think one of the important things is you're talking about the standard brushing acts of grooming. A lot of people in their grooming kits have sprays and topicals and things that they okay. dress and finish the coat with. Mm. So I think that could be one, mm -hmm. an area where you can overdo yeah. it. I think yeah. your advice is often, you know, as long as you're you're doing what's normal and natural for the horse, it's a good thing, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's what this feels like, because a lot of what these cray combs do is they stimulate the grooming activity these are that elbow, horses do. This is elbow grease. Like I like yeah. elbow grease and not... not Actual grease. grease. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, yeah. there you go, right. So um, I think you know with those coat conditioners and things like that, you can definitely overdo it. Anything right. that's artificial, because they have silicone and that's very drying to the skin, which is the opposite of what she wants to right. do. Right. So it makes it shiny for the short term in the show ring, mm -hmm. which is a lot of sh words, but it's a good <laughs> idea and is a great thing to use when you need it. But it's not the kind of thing you, I would say you want to use every day on a regular basis. Yeah, definitely right. dries things out. All right. We okay. thought of a con. Good job. Yay. <laughs> Submitted by Horsegirl88 on YouTube, question three is, what should you know before buying your first horse? And then to, I think, hopefully ensure that she got voted in the top, she said, also, your videos are wonderful. And I would just like to say, Horsegirl88, you are wonderful. <laughs> yeah, those are helpful. I, I think it's very exciting when someone's getting their first horse. I it totally like. agree. And I try to think back, you know, but that was so long ago that I can't remember. So, so um, the first thing I think about is, what is your interest? What do you want to do? Kind of, you, you have to know, at least right now, it could change, certainly mine has, but are you an English person? Or do you ride Western? Do you want to compete? Is pleasure riding more your style? You have to kind of know what you're headed towards, so you... I feel like you change yours at least once annually. At least once annually, yeah. yes. You've done all of the things. Yeah, yeah, sometimes not with the right tack, but... Um, there was talk of English saddle barrel racing, which oh, seemed unwise and maybe didn't well. go well. Yeah, no. yeah. But so you have to know what you what you want to do, and then then you have to know your budget. I yep. think that's huge, and I maybe should have said that first. But it's not just how much can I afford to spend on the horse to the initial purchase. Yes, it's the monthly upkeep. And let me tell you, the monthly upkeep. I figured out one one year only. Um, I figured out what I spend each month and got an annual total and oh, I boy. just about passed out yeah, and bad. the husband did not see that but you have to know going in what it costs to keep that horse whether you keep it on your own place or you board it those are another to another area that you have to consider um, the cost can be just astounding um, then who's gonna who's gonna work with you whether it's your trainer 
and who's going to be your veterinarian. And you start with the vet early. Based on the cost of the horse and what you're going to do with them, like if you're buying a horse to show at the top levels of a sport, which she probably isn't doing getting her first horse, you'd want to have a pre-purchase. So you have that vet. But immediately when you have your first horse, you want to have a veterinarian ready and waiting. Because yep. they're like accidents, not even waiting to happen. There's accidents, <laughs> right? Um, you need to know some basic horse health and nutrition yourself, mm -hmm. even if you have a vet, and even if you're boarding and someone's keeping your horse for you, you need to know the normals so that you can recognize the abnormal, know when to call the vet. And even at the beginning, there's basic, basic first aid kits. Maybe all you have right away is a thermometer mm -hmm. and some bandages. You're always going to need uh, wraps on a horse for one reason or another. Um, and as you get more um, experience and knowledge, your first aid kit will grow. Mm -hmm. I look at the first aid kit as sort of a reflection of how long you've been in the business and, and what all you've seen. So um, I, I don't know if she's done this already, but I think a really good way to get into horse ownership is it's not actually owning a horse, but it's leasing. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't done a half lease or a full lease, that's a great suggestion. Also being a working student, you learn a ton. You work yes. really hard, but you learn a ton because you're, you're in someone's barn. Um, and that's a really great way, being a working student yeah. in particular, to get exposure to a variety of horses because that helps you learn what you like and don't like. Without having to commit. Exactly. Yeah. And so for, me, for you, maybe it's really important to have a horse who's pleasant on the cross ties because that's a big part of If you're this religious groomer that we had in the last question, mm -hmm. you want to have fun mm -hmm. hanging out with your horse. Right. But if you're looking for an upper level competitor, a lot of those horses have strong personalities. They do not want to be spending time right. getting hugged on the cross ties. <laughs> they want to be able to do their own thing. So it's, yeah. it's important. You really have to know what you like and what you don't mm -hmm. Like, because mm -hmm. once you have the horse, you're responsible for that horse. Correct, and they live a long time. They do. So, yeah. That's all the advice I have. I'm just good luck and very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Let us know how it goes. Send us pictures. Question number four was submitted by Emily on the Ask the Vet form, which you can find at smartpack.com slash ask the vet questions. And Emily is wondering, this one is for you, Dr. Lydia Gray, which with a start like that, I have to believe it's either about poop or deworming, and I think you only like deworming because it's mostly about poop. We'll never know. <laughs> so Emily is wondering, a horse's poop can tell yes, a horse's <laughs> poop can tell us humans a lot about the horse's health. So I'm wondering, what should we look for in the appearance of the poop, and when should we worry if the poop looks abnormal? Also, how much should a horse poop in one day? Well, so when I read this, we were having where I live. 37 inches of snow. I thought you were in say nine lunch. days. We were having lunch now. We were having a lot, a lot of snow, and we push a wheelbarrow out to the paddock to clean manure every day. And between 37 inches of snow and not really being able to see it, I gave up. And what I did was I gave up on the the manure fork because they were frozen. I just went out and picked the fecal balls up with my hands. Oh, yeah, I haven't been there. There's no shame in that game. Oh, okay, okay, so. You're among friends. <laughs> okay. Um, but those, those questions were fascinating. I had to go look some of them up. I feel like the answers to her how much questions were a lot. It turns out that a 1,000-pound horse poops about 50 pounds a day. I believe and it. And when you calculate out the math, it's nine tons a year. So you have to have a good manure management system, whether it's having it removed or composting it or spreading it. I mean, that's per horse. And that's, that's for a wild. thousand pound horse. So if you have a larger horse like I do, it's, it's more than that. Um, I did some other calculations and I figured out that they, given that those figures, they, they pass manure about anywhere from eight to 12 times a day. Okay. So about every two to three hours, mm -hmm. there should be a pile. Um, so that also checks out with my personal experience. <laughs> yeah, right. So everyone's up back in their head thinking, yeah, that works. And so that's that's quantity, and that's that's important because if you don't see, if you go out at the end of the day and you're expecting ten piles of, of manure and you see two, that's a problem. And now you know, I might not get to ride tonight. I just might be observing my horse, and there might be a phone call to a vet coming up soon. Mm -hmm. And that's why quantity is important, and, and size of the pile. Like you, you can go out in a herd and know 
which pile is from which horse Absolutely. because of the size of the fecal balls and the size of the pile. And sometimes horses they poop in a pile and some just walk and poop in it. So you get to know each horse. Um, anyway, that's all quantity. For quality, there's <laughs> the moistness. So fecal balls are formed, they have shapes, but they're also the outside, I look at this closely, they're a little bit shiny and wet. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be hard and dry. When they're new. Yeah, when it's they, right. First like if you see a horse, don't 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 you see a horse pass a manure pile and run out there and look at it? Is that just me? Uh, I look at it and then I I'm like, oh, that's they're smaller than normal and they're hard and dry. And mm -hmm. I'm like, uh oh, somebody's not drinking enough water. You need some more salt. Um, th on the other hand, they can be not formed mm -hmm. or like barely formed and like the cow patty land. kind of. Well, even before that, they land and kind of just fall apart a little mm -hmm. bit. When they get when they begin to get to the, the cow pile, the the patty stage and even less like liquid stool is a serious problem. When a horse's stool gets soft, that's when I begin to take temperature. Mm -hmm. And if the horse isn't acting correct either, like maybe not wanting to eat or eat the whole meal or he head down a little bit or not as energetic, I I, I would be ringing up the vet mm -hmm. and say this is what I observed in his temperament, and here's his temperature, and let me describe the poop to you in colorful you know, terms. And, and then the vet will say, uh, this is going around maybe, mm -hmm. and it takes about two days, and then it's done, or, um, or I haven't heard of any horse doing this, so I should come out, but they'll, they'll sort of triage that for you. I will say that there are some things that can make the uh, manure softer, like trailering. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, when you get those shipping boots out, the, the quantity and the quality changes dramatically. <laughs> but again, that's, that's nerves and stress. And, yeah. and some horses, we have a horse at our barn, that when you take him into the indoor arena, it's just like it's a trailer. And it, it gets softer and, and more frequent. So um, there are some conditions that, that cause that that really aren't anything to, to worry about. So um, co color, I don't think we talked about color. Mm -hmm. It can range from like if they're eating the really bright green dairy cattle alfalfa hay okay, their 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 manure can also be bright green but if they're eating regular even last year's grass hay that's a little bit you know brown then then it's going to be brown beet pulp can make give it a little tiny bit of reddish tinge um, if there is blood or even if it looks black which means like old dried blood those would be things I would be on the phone with my vet about. Um, so the really loose, even projectile stool, that's that's bad. Mm -hmm. And then blood is is bad. And and I don't I don't think anyone sees worms anymore. No, Do you I see, have not heard that yeah. word seen you around the barn. Might especially after a deworming, like if you got a new horse and you didn't know his parasite control history, and then you dewormed him, and then maybe you'd see some because maybe he didn't have good care in the past, but. I, I really don't hear about that anymore, but I guess that's possible. Okay. I could go on all day. I, I, was, yeah, I was gonna say, you were right, Emily. That was a question for Dr. Gray. Last but not least, we have Haley on YouTube who's asking, feeding oats the do's and don'ts. What are the benefits, downsides of feeding them? My grandparents fed them when I was growing up and all of their horses were top performers and never had any issues. I still currently feed them and like the benefits of being more natural. My horses are also in free choice loose minerals along with free choice hay and pasture, weather permitting. Okay. Well, when I was making a list of pros and cons, mm -hmm. of do's and don'ts or whatever she called them, it was kind of the same things on both lists. Like, Oats are a great source of calories. Mm -hmm. So if you have a horse that needs, like you hear of racehorse oats, you know, if you have a horse that's a hard worker or a hard keeper, um, then they're an excellent source of calories because they have sugars and starches, they're, they're comprised of sugars and starches, they're, they're in there, but if you're gonna feed sugars and starches, they're some of the most digestible and safe ones mm. in that the horse has enzymes in the foregut, so the stomach and the small intestine, that um, digest these simple carbohydrates so they don't make it back to the hindgut where they would get incorrectly fermented by the bacteria. That's, mm -hmm. that's what happens with corn. So we don't like corn as a grain. But oat is, oats are a very, they're a safer grain. So the converse to that is oats are a great source of calories. If you have an easy keeper or a horse who's not working. We won't mention any names. <laughs> they, they don't need oats because 
there's, they're actually not a good source of nutrition. Mm -hmm. They have around 10% protein, and the, the protein or the amino acid profile is not very complete. Mm -hmm. So it's not a good source of protein. Their calcium um, phosphorus ratio is inverted. Oh. So they have more, they're higher in phosphorus and lower in calcium, which can be a problem if you feed a lot. Um, and it can, it can offset the balance of the diet. They don't have a lot of other um, vitamins and minerals, so they're not really completing sure. the diet. Yeah. Um, they have a little bit of fat in them, so as a source of, of a, a broad source of nutrition, they're actually not a great choice. So their role in a horse diet is as a source of calories or energy, and, and then so you feed the forage, and then you feed the oats as calories only if your horse needs them. And then you're required to provide some sort of ration balancer pellet or multivitamin supplement so that they get the actual nutrition. Now something, I think she talked about loose or free choice minerals? Yes. Okay, I should take this platform and say the, there's only one mineral that horses have a natural desire to seek out and, and consume, and that's salt or sodium. They don't have the ability to say, I'm low in copper today, I'm gonna to take some copper, or I need more potassium today. They don't, nobody has that ability. That has been proven not a thing. So rather than the free choice minerals, I would go with a ration balancer or a multivitamin mineral supplement. And then only the oats as you need them mm -hmm. is, is what I would do. So hey, Oats is if needed, but some sort of balancer pellet. How do you choose between a ration balancer and a multivitamin? Because they are very similar in the mm -hmm. vitamins and minerals mm -hmm. side of things, but they're different. The difference is that the ration balancer is going to be fed in larger quantities. It's usually a pellet because it also contains protein or amino acids. So if you know that your hay is not a great source of protein, like maybe it's less than 10%, it doesn't have a good quality a profile of amino acids either, then a ration balancer might be the better choice. It's also good if you're mixing in a lot of stuff, there's more stuff to put in because you're feeding like a pound maybe of the ration balancer where you're only feeding an ounce, two ounces of the multivitamin mineral supplement. So if you have other supplements for your horse, the ration balancer is a better place to hide that stuff. <laughs> and mix it in. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. All right, well those were all the questions that we had this month. Thank you guys so much for submitting your questions. You can submit questions for April in uh, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, on our blog at blog.smartpack.com, on our form at smartpack.com slash askthevetquestions. When you submit your question in any of those places, do use hashtag AskTheVetVideo so that we can make sure we keep track of all those mm -hmm. questions, because otherwise there's just questions out there getting asked to the universe that who knows what kind of answer you're going to get. So any received before March 8th will be eligible for the voting for our April episode, and then you can vote on YouTube, Twitter, and our blog. So keep an eye out for that, and if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll never miss a notification about the voting. Are there people who don't subscribe to our I YouTube? I think so. I think people have a real fear of commitment. Oh. Yeah. If your question was answered in this video or in a previous episode, you can email customercare at smartpack.com and you will get your gift card. That's right. For those of you watching for the first time, you get money to spend at SmartPack and a great answer to your and individual maybe a questions. Joke. That's right. Maybe a joke. Maybe a dad joke. Who knows? <laughs> so thank you all for watching. Thanks for asking the vet and have a great ride.